Hi class, um, today I want to give you just a brief transition from the Middle East, meaning Sumeria and Egypt, um, to the, and from the prehistory period into um, the period of writing, approximately 3200 and on, meaning, right, the time is getting lower, going to zero, and the, the Christian era. That's our timeline. Um, the thing that is interesting about the Rosetta Stone, um, actually there are a couple of things, so stay with me for a few minutes uh, about this. One is that um, it makes the transition for us from prehistory, which is when writing was not used a lot and we did our artifact um, um project to sort of demonstrate what artifacts meant in communication with within the group and outside of the group. And it makes the transition to the written period. Also, by the way, if I'm looking elsewhere, it's just because, as I said, I'm looking at my notes. Um, that's number one. It makes this transition to approximately, you know, the Neolithic writing period, which we saw in... Um, in, um, you know, the issuance of the laws and Hammurabi, uh, Hammurabi's code and, all, and the importance of the scribes. But let's go on and look at the Rosetta Stone. The other reason it's interesting, not just for this transition, was because we didn't even discover it until, uh, what is the date? Um, like uh, in the 1800s, which is... So until the 1800s, we had no idea about any of the subject matter in writing in that area. So here is an example of science, the discovery of science, archaeology, changing our perspective on history. Because we believe that the Rosetta Stone, which was discovered by a French archaeologist uh, in the 1800s uh, named Jean-Francois Chapollion, um, he believes, they believe now that it was written in approximately 196 uh, BCE. That's kind of late, but what it tells us is that um, this is something that takes its meaning uh, and shows us something about their culture during the written period. So, what is on the Rosetta Stone? Uh, first of all, it was um, discovered having uh, in Egypt, and it was discovered having three different languages on it. One is um, ancient Greek, which by 196 is pretty dominant. We'll study that soon when we get to the Greeks. Um, and a kind of Egyptian script, which is going to be a little more sophisticated. And finally, what is the Egyptian writing? You probably heard all about this since you're tiny, hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics is not the same as the Sumerian cuneiform, which is sort of just um, uh, taking the edge out of a, uh, making a wedge in the cement. But Egyptian writing illustrates a lot of scripts. And if you look on page 27, at least volume 19 of your book, you'll see some different examples. Um, Egyptian writing evolved from sort of the pictograph, which you can see of the um, in page 196, into different um, examples of letters. For example, and I, I've got to figure out how to do, um, you know, like a demonstration with this um, film thing so that I can show you some pictures. But, for example, um, the it was kind of a picture of a house. And that makes the, eventually is going to make, sorry, the um, word bait or bite in Semitic languages, which means house. And exactly, the picture looks like a house with three sides and one open door. At any rate, so let's remember the Rosetta Stone, not discovered by scientists, which means there's probably other things out there we haven't discovered either. Uh, 196 BCE, it definitely is the period of writing. Um, so we know by the time we get to Jesus's time, 
in the Middle East. There was a lot of writing going on. They were even doing Greek, um, Egyptian script, and hieroglyphics, which you've heard of. So go to um, those pages in your book, and you can actually see what that is. We believe, scholars believe, that hieroglyphics, at least, the least sophisticated of the Rosetta Stone writing, which is found at the bottom, was developed approximately during that transition from prehistory to history, approximately 3200 BCE. That's about the same time the pictograms were in Mesopotamia. Um, but the two scripts are so different, so let's not um, compare them substantively. But it is interesting, isn't it, that in Sumeria and Egypt, a writing, if you will, developed approximately the same time. Um, now, why don't we have too much of the Egyptian script remaining? Why haven't we been able to see that? And remember, I argued that um, that you know, we know, we think they were so into mummies and death, the Egyptians, because that's what survived. The papyri that they wrote with are from reeds. They were hammered, dried, and they used a purple ink, um, which if you look at the maps in the next chapter, you'll discover where it comes from. A purple, purple squid ink to write on the papyrus. Um, and it was called hieratic, the Egyptian um, script, using um, the ink on the papyrus. And of course, you know, it doesn't survive very long, probably because it was so wet, uh, humid, um, by the water. The hieroglyphic just, the hieroglyphics on papyrus just did not survive as well as some of the other artifacts, because we assume there were a lot of these documents written. Um, that would have helped or would still help us understand, you know, the old kingdom, Egypt. Now, um, so what am I, uh, let, just to review. One, uh, the discovery of the hieroglyphics and the Rosetta Stone, um, hieratic Egyptian script, dynamic, and the Greek shows us what? Obviously that Greeks were somewhere near there, taken over, or they were knowledgeable enough to write Greek, to write the Egyptian script and the hieroglyphics in approximately 196. We believe that approximately 3200 prehistory takes us to writing in Egypt. Um, and we can prove the point about science having a huge influence on the way historians understand the past. So those are important things. Um, we also finally believe that ancient Egyptian script influenced many African and Middle Eastern languages, which are often called Semitic languages, Arabic, Hebrew, Ethiopian, period. However, the one interesting thing, um, we believe that the closest remaining um, example of Egyptian writing may be in Ethiopia with what is called the Coptic uh, print. And Coptic print in Ethiopia represents, interestingly enough, um, something that's being used even today in Ethiopia in what is called the Coptic Church, which is a Christian church. Just, you know, throwing out these things, they're interesting. Now, uh, before I finish this chapter, go on to chapter two, believe it or not, finally, um, which is not a long chapter, I do just want to say that um, we sort of emphasize the similarities in this, um, or rather, I'm sorry, the differences in this chapter between Mesopotamia and Egypt, the Long Nile, the um, shorter kingdoms between the Tigris and the Euphrates. But what are similarities? Both developed technologies of writing at about the same time. Um, this allowed what? Better trade, uh, travel. Um, they could transmit important information to the population. Um, we know, for example, about both, they had elaborate religious ritual. We know, these are all similarities. They both developed irrigation technology on their um, riverbanks. Um, so although they were probably not in too much contact, we do know that these things developed approximately the same time in both cultures. 
Now, what is interesting about our study of um, the cradle of civilization and Western civilization is the following. We've discovered and discussed the ancients, starting with the building of civilizations. And in chapter one, we go through those ancient civilizations, the building of technology, language, etc., and where those civilizations were. Now, in chapter two, um, which is called People's Gods and Empire, the timeline takes us from 1700 BCE to approximately 500. So we're making tracks going to um, the um, zero hour or the birth of Christ. Um, in this chapter, we see that the area, not in the Middle East, um, but in the Mediterranean, Greece, Southern Italy, um, Cyprus, those are the things we know them as today. I want you to pay special attention in Norton uh, to the maps. So I want you to please look at the maps of the Middle East and now of Greece and the Mediterranean. What you will see in those maps is we're going to see a beginning of a migration of travel and really large groups of people moving both from, um, not so much the Middle East to the Mediterranean, but from Europe, what we know as Europe today, into the Mediterranean, and we'll discuss why. Um, um, so now a couple other things. I just want to make sure, uh, apropos of the language notes I left you, that you know when we study like 1000 BCE, 2000 BCE, those are called millennia because they're 1,000 years, okay? So 2,000 BCE um, is going to be 2,000 BCE. Um, and right now we're going to study, after the development of writing, approximately from 1,700, 2,000 second millennia, to 500 BCE. Um, now, I think that's about all. I'd like for you to just kind of make tracks reading um, reading chapter two. There's a big mystery about these people called the sea people in chapter two, which I might ask you who you think they are, who does your book think they are, etc. But that should do it from the transition from uh, ancient Sumerian culture and Egyptian culture to um, Mediterranean Basin culture, the understanding, new understandings of science as it relates to history, and finally the origins and development of writing and all of the things that it allows, whether it's in Sumeria or Egypt. Okie dokie, I'll speak to you probably later today or tomorrow about chapter two. Thank you.